here today. Uh, this is Aboriginal land. It always was and always will be. And uh, sovereignty was never ceded. So um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the Aboriginal elders of the lands that you're all joining me from all around Australia. So welcome, a few more people are coming through now, but I will, um, I'll start by letting the people here know that you can, you will be on mute, but you can uh, ask questions at any time and I will try and give them at the end for you. And you do that in the chat function and I am going to sneakily put a link to the book, which is <laughs> right there. And that will show you where the chat is, just there on the chat. Um, so that's where you can ask your questions at any time during the event tonight. So feel free if you think of something on the run, just type it in there and I'll try and get to it at the end. Really good. Okay, so it's very exciting tonight to have this event. Um, particularly given that our author is also in lockdown um, <laughs> and we're still able to chat to her. Um, so thanks, Glenn, for, um, you know, soldiering through. Um, oh, but thank you. I'm going to let, I'm going to let Jenny um, introduce Clem. But, um, yeah, so just remember that um, you can ask your questions to Clem on that chat at any time. And I'm going to hand right over to Jenny Falentish, who is the author of the acclaimed Woman of Substances, a regular contributor to the Sydney Morning Herald and the Saturday paper, and former editor of Time Out Melbourne and Triple J's J Mag. She grew up in Slough, a satellite town of London, I hope I said that right, um, and moved to Australia in 2006. Her latest book, Everything Harder Than Everyone Else, was released earlier this year and we got to do an event for it, which was fantastic. One of the many events that we've managed to squeeze in between shutdowns. So um, welcome everybody to Jenny Valentish. Thanks so much, Chrissy, and thanks to Avid Reader for, for hosting this. And indeed, yes, my event a few months ago. Uh, I'm in Castle, Maine, so I'm on Jajawaran country. Um, and um, yeah. I'm going to introduce you to Clem. Look, I would imagine that writing Late Bloomer felt like something of a calling because it, it reads that way. And I certainly feel that now that we know more about the fact that autism and ADHD aren't actually male disorders, and we mm. know that they can present in all different ways, it's time that people who are seeking a diagnosis later in life, as Clem did, they, it's time they had a really great memoir from someone in their shoes. And I have read a few, but this book in particular, as you might expect, is eminently readable. You're probably all fans of Clem's work in terms of her pop culture criticism. Her writing appears regularly in the Saturday paper and The Guardian. Uh, she's written about film and TV for The Lifted Brow, Kill Your Darling. She's contributed chapters to books, including Investigating Stranger Things, Refocus, the films of Elaine May, and Copy Fight. And maybe you've also admired her cosplay outfits on Instagram. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not wearing one now. <laughs> no, what? Uh, so that voice that you're accustomed to and those deep dives into pop culture all throughout this book too, and it just makes it so much more enjoyable and so much more Clem. So Clem, thank you for writing this book. Do you want to kick us off with a reading, which I think is right from the beginning, yeah? Yeah, I might. Um, I would also just like to acknowledge that um, I'm here on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land in lockdown Melbourne and also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I am going to start from the start. I'm not going to go right from the start because there is a little, uh, you know, prologue that I think um, I don't want to spoil, but um, I'm going to read to you from uh, the first chapter, which is called, uh, Well, How Did I Get Here? After being assessed for autism spectrum disorder shortly before my 36th birthday in 2018, Everything moved in slow motion while I waited for the results. The journey to receive my diagnostic report, or as I feared at the time, lack thereof, took one hour and 38 minutes. Across the course of that journey, on 3rd of September 2018, I listened to Queen's Now I'm Here approximately 23 times. Getting ahead of myself, I'd already picked out the image that would articulate on social media my feelings if I was diagnosed as autistic. A monster truck slamming over a giant mud pile, its livery daubed with the slogan, Autism, it's not for wimps. Monster trucks are extremely sick. Did you know there's a monster truck called Higher Education that's made from a school bus? 
One of the happiest moments of my life was when we went as a family to the Monster Truck Madness and Supercross Masters Spectacular at Rod Laver Arena. The Monster Truck's image served a number of purposes. I was touched by the story behind the picture. The truck's driver was a down-home bloke whose autistic nephew inspired him to raise autism awareness by mowing down car carcasses in mud-daubed arenas while heavy metal played. But it also served as a preemptive show of confidence. I knew that my being autistic would be a surprise to some and that their reaction would likely be one of incredulity. By assuming the persona of the autism monster truck, I could do a burnout so loud it would drown out any critical voices, including my own. Diagnosis, it's also not for wimps. A year or so earlier, I'd been in a script development meeting discussing a screenplay I'd been writing. The general tone of the meeting was, as was often the case with my screenwriting, that the script was stru structured well, thank you, and very funny, oh, thank you, but there seemed to be consensus that my protagonist was confusing the reader. Nobody really seemed to know what was driving her actions. It seemed perfectly clear to me. It's a romantic comedy, so the expectations of genre and plot dictate that the protagonist must start the script thinking she wants something in particular, but learning that she needs something else. It's my job as a screenwriter to deliver this in a fresh and entertaining way. Apparently this was not the correct answer, because this character's emotional motivation was, according to the experts assembled before me, utterly opaque. As soon as this topic arose, I grasped the moulded plastic arms of my office chair with a white-knuckled grip. I knew what was coming. It was the same question that's always coming in any discussion of screenwriting, the one about the protagonist's emotional journey. What's her problem? And I knew it would be utterly unprofessional to respond in the way I felt compelled to, which is to yell, I don't fucking know, before throwing my office chair through the window and rappelling down the outside of the building. I didn't know what my protagonist was feeling because I barely knew about my own emotional state at any given moment. I only perceived the broad brushstrokes of vivid primary colour emotions. Happy, sad, angry at best. Maybe hungry? No, that one is often a mystery too. That I was generally the last to recognise. You know those moments in movies where robots become self-aware and cry for the first time and reach up in amazement to touch the tears rolling down their cheeks? That's me every time my body has an emotional response to something. I mean, I did know what the protagonist's problem was, at least to a certain extent. I had recently decided that she was on the spectrum. Up until that point, it had never really occurred to me that the female protagonist of the very loosely autobiographical screenplay I'd been working on for a while might be autistic, even when I had a minor character yell at her, Jesus, are you on the spectrum or something? That is, until I consulted The Emotional Wound Thesaurus, A Writer's Guide to Emotional Trauma, a popular text that aims to assist screenwriters in, quote, rooting your characters in reality by giving them an authentic wound that causes difficulties and prompts them to strive for inner growth to overcome it. My script editor had recommended I look through it to consider some different approaches that might liven up the next draft, given the issues I was having in communicating the protagonist's emotional state. Skimming over the entry for social difficulties, I noticed that one of the examples given was that a character may struggle socially as the result of autism. Intrigued, I read on. As I read the words, basic needs often compromised by this wound, love and belonging, esteem and recognition, self-actualization. Peter Gabriel's Salisbury Hill started playing as I gazed skyward in a moment of realization. Shortly after, I googled terms I had never thought to look up in tandem before, female plus autism, and entered a research hole that was, in its intensity, not unlike Lilu in The Fifth Element learning all about all of, about all of human history while eating microwave roast chicken. You've seen those galaxy brains? Memes? That was me. I read about how boys are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at a rate roughly three times that of girls. I read about how girls and women may be misdiagnosed with other conditions, such as obsessive compulsive disorder or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, while their autism is missed because its presentation is different. I read about how autistic girls are more likely to camouflage or mask their autistic behaviours. Across dozens of tabs and hundreds of hours, I read absolutely everything I could find on the topic. After exclaiming, oh God, that's me, for the 20th time, I texted an autistic friend and asked if she thought I might be, as they say, on the spectrum myself. Her response was one of delighted relief. Lol, we have had our suspicions about you. I returned to my screenplay and realised what I'd been missing. Not only was the protagonist autistic, it seemed that I might be too. What happens next? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to find out. I know. Me neither. Well, I've read it. But I love that you have your penny drop moments for your protagonist. That's just excellent. Yeah. Um, 
And look, you, you hold a master of screenwriting from BCA. I'm just going to drop some more bio in subtly here. <laughs> and you teach screenwriting at University of Melbourne and you're undertaking a PhD in action cinema and screenwriting. Yep. Um, yet you have this sort of very logical nuts and bolts approach to, this is a romantic comedy. Mm. So um, how have you got around that or do you just sort of work with it? Well... <laughs> I think I understand it now. I, I think the, the problem was, and, and it was interesting, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about having kind of written myself to a diagnosis was that, like so many things um, about being undiagnosed, you're sort of just hitting your head against the wall again and again. So, so f in the writing context, it was like, why can't I seem to get this character across to people? Like it felt very, it felt real and kind of normal to me. And so I would get this feedback, which was just consistently confusing. And it felt like, um, my skills were sort of improving at a rate that you would expect in other areas, and yet this thing was always staying the same. Um, so now that I understand that, I think I am better at, um, you know, kind of it's not working around it, working with it, I guess. But then I, you know, part part of my research that I'm doing now is 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 kind of political. It's looking at the issues that that autistic screenwriters might have, you know, based on my own experiences with certain aspects of screenwriting, um, you know, dictums and orthodoxies, which which expect a level of emotional literacy that I think most people are not capable of. Um, but, you know, it's particularly hard when you're autistic. So I think I, think I um, it's interesting because screenwriting is something that I really love, but it, there is this kind of bittersweet thing where it's like, I'm also, I also know my, my kind of, my shortcomings, which are, I think intertwined with autism. Um, I don't think it's a complete disaster, um, but yes, I'm very interested in things like structures because I think there's an autistic quality to that. You know, it's kind of like a social script. We sit down to watch a movie in a particular genre and there are um, expectations that we have about the way they unfold and those ideas of like plot structures. You know, we all know that at a certain point in a rom-com they're going to break up and then they'll spend some time apart and they get back together. And that's sort of what makes it relaxing to watch. It's like we know what we're going to get. We kind of just want to see what the sort of fresh take on that is. Um, so I think that that's, that's, what I, that's one of the things I really love about screenwriting. And I love, you know, I also just love to see people who don't have a problem with writing emotion because um, it's kind of instructive to me, I guess. I'm like, oh, that's how they did it. You know, that's how they represented that on the page. Okay, gotcha. You know, it's about facial expressions or, or music cues. So I think I, I think I get around it in a very autistic way. Um, so what is in my script might not be considered to be good by certain, you know, um, industry standards, but it's it's still there. It's just different. And I guess that's the kind of ultimately, you know, you can boil the kind of neurodiversity movement down to that. It's this idea of, you know, different, not less. So it's not that my screenwriting was wrong or bad. I was just doing it in a different way, but I didn't know that. Absolutely. I mean, I teach writing sometimes as well. And, and I, when, I, when I'm when i explaining it to people, I realise I'm sort of giving them a formula and then you feel really mm. guilty, like, well, you probably thought there was more magic involved than that. <laughs> not when I do it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I even found, you know, writing the book, like the first draft was, I think most people who have written a book um, or any kind of long form piece will, will experience a, a similar level of existential, you know, terror during that first draft. But for me, what made it really come together was that idea of structure and, and, and theme and, you know, um, finding a way to kind of arrange all of these raw materials um, in a way that was engaging for the reader or, you know, hopefully. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think structure and rules and, and, you know, it sounds very autistic to say it, but I think that's that's kind of where I, um, you know, I appreciate like a really elegantly put together uh, magazine essay, for example. So that was once I kind of got the basics out and got the kind of rough story of my life and, and had an idea of what I wanted to say, then it was kind of about, yeah, kind of structuring it into something that, that took the took the reader on. I hesitate to say a journey, um, but but yeah, just kind of turned it into something that was using my experience as a, as a way to contextualise these broader themes. So it wasn't just about me, um, but yeah, it was using my experience as, as a kind of case study, I guess, or a sort of jumping off point. Let's go on that journey. Yes. Um, let's go right back to the beginning. Take us back in time. You grew up in Port Melbourne. Run us through some of young Clem's obsessions. Ah, oh, look, the the big one, uh, and this, you know, is a is a huge part of the book. Is it was dinosaurs, and I think that was the first time that 
I guess I noticed that my level of of enthusiasm for the things that I was interested in was was kind of above and beyond. Um, you know, most kids who have a dinosaur phase, it's like, this is my favorite stuffed dinosaur, or I, you know, I like Tyrannosaurus Rex, or they might learn a few names, but you know, I was like a five year old reading uh, this kind of heretical, you know, paleontological theory. Um, I was, you know, I'd sort of watched every David Attenborough dinosaur documentary I could back to front. Um, and I think, I think that was one of the first ones. Ghostbusters was another one. And, you know, with Ghostbusters for me, it was also kind of a way to construct a persona and, and find ways to engage with other people. Cause I found even at that young age, I found socializing really difficult. And I would often find that the things that I, you know, wanted to do, other kids didn't want to, or I didn't understand the games that they wanted to play. So, you know, in seeing Ghostbusters, I could go, there's some, ah, oh, people are laughing at those lines. I'll, you know, I'll use them. So I sort of turned myself into Peter Venkman, um, Bill Murray's character for a long time. Mm -hmm. So I think they were kind of the twin ones. And I guess to a certain extent, also My Little Ponies. And I think, I think <laughs> that's a good example because often what happens with young girls um, is that their special interests or circumscribed interests are dismissed as, you know, girl stuff. Mm -hmm. So for me, it probably didn't look all that unusual to be really interested in My Little Ponies. But if you, if you kind of looked a bit deeper, the way I played with them was, was very, you know, I sort of just lined them up and I, I wanted to keep them looking perfect and I didn't really... There wasn't much rough and tumble, you know, I didn't want other people to touch them. I knew everything about them. I kind of kept every little like biographical slip that came in the box. So yeah, I, it's the, the interesting thing about writing the book, I guess, but also that process of, of learning about, um, you know, having, well, obviously I've been autistic the whole time, but having that renewed understanding is going back and looking at those things and going, okay, that fits, you know, so that's why that was such an intense passion or, you know, that's why that thing was difficult. And I think, I think that's the really interesting roller coaster that you go on when, when you're diagnosed later in life, because you, you get this uh, sense of understanding and it's almost like a kind of cheat code or like a, a sort of puzzle key to, to work out why things have happened the way they have. And, and, um, and and then you do go back in time and kind of have this like w all these what ifs or you know in the book i call them the sliding doors moments where maybe there was a teacher who said that something was up but they weren't quite sure what and you know what would have happened if somebody had pursued that but um yeah the dinosaurs is the classic for me and i was really you know i was really pleased when when hardy grant put the book together that anna the um the editor found these little dinosaur dinkuses i think they're called which are they're kind of the, the breaks between between segments in the book so <laughs> alas i've forgotten it all now <laughs> i wish i still knew you know all of the latin names but but uh, unfortunately they eventually got replaced with other special interests but who knew that my little ponies were the the girl equivalent of train spotting yeah exactly you know <laughs> i i knew their whole biographies and i knew who was friends with who and who wouldn't do what and you know, if such and such didn't like lollies, well, she wasn't going the, going to go in the sweet shop. You know, it was very, <laughs> it was very structured play. <laughs> you write in a book as well about things like coordination and motor skills. Like your sports teacher said you had inappropriate arms, mm. which is funny because I, you went through a massive gym phase on Instagram. Yeah. And I was like, so getting into looking at the whiteboard behind your head, which had like eight burpees. <laughs> 12 jump squats. I was <laughs> loving it. So obviously you've overcome something. Yeah. Like skills. Yeah. I think that was a process of reclaiming something, you know, because that, that really threw me. I was, I think, a pretty enthusiastic, active kid. And to see that, oh, I wasn't really probably meant to see it. You know, it was one of the few times I kind of had a look over the teacher's shoulder and, yeah, to see this note that I had inappropriate arm swing. Yes. Again, was, you know, one of those sliding door moments. Like, what did that mean? You know, was I kind of stimming? Was I flapping my arms? Was I whatever? You know, did I have low muscle tone? But but instead it was just kind of this moment where I went, I'm bad at sport, you know, and then I just kind of couldn't get that back. Um, and I mean, you know, broadly speaking, if you're not a sporty, you know, sporting kind of kid, school sports are pretty, pretty shit house. Um, but yeah, I think getting into the gym, I mean, I know a lot of autistic people who, who really are really into particularly things like powerlifting and, and bodybuilding, because I think, again, you have that structure. So you have, 
you you sort of give yourself this plan and it's it's very kind of on Monday I go in and I do legs and you know then on Thursday I do my high intensity interval training and I really really enjoyed that um and uh you know I actually met quite a few fellow autistic people through that through kind of engaging in things like powerlifting online that was where I found quite a few um, you know hashtag actually autistic people um so yeah I think um I think that was an interesting turnaround for me because I had traditionally, you know, told myself, oh, I just don't like it or I'm not much of a gym person. But I think that that was really just kind of a trauma. You know, I just had these horrible experiences again and again and didn't really understand them. Mm. Um, and part of that, yeah, was, you know, that I probably had issues with coordination and, and muscle development and things that, that we know to be um, part of autism but because i didn't know that was what was happening you just become the person who's bad at sport you know all the uncos so i think um that you know one of the things i guess that people worry about often parents and teachers about you know should i diagnose should i take my kid to get diagnosed or you know that that fear that somebody will be labeled the problem is if you don't have a true label um, which for me was autistic then there are so many other ones that just kind of rush in to take its place. And they're often, they're often really harmful, you know, and kids are, kids are horrendous, you know? So I think um, for me, that was stuff like, yeah, bad at sport, unco, you know, um, not good at, you know, bad at maths, bad at this, bad at that. And so rather than being able to go, oh, it's just because my brain is better at other things than this. um, You know, I sort of had to fill in the gaps myself. And unfortunately, a lot of the time um, that, 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 that act of filling in the gaps was very kind of negative. I wanted to talk about autism and and having a role. Um, Mm. Like the way it's been explained to me by psychologists is that people with autism feel relieved if they have a role, but don't do so well kind of freestyling. So Mm. like you've been into some literal role-playing stuff like Dungeons and Dragons and cosplay. (laughs) What do you think of that role play role theory more generally? Like, you know, maybe it's, easier to talk to people if you're on a stage and you're the person on the stage than it is making small talk that kind of thing you know absolutely you know i'm a big performer um and i think that that is the sort of uh, i'm bad with metaphors so i don't know if it's a catch-22 or a double-edged sword or something but you know as i have been publicizing the book i'm aware of this fact that when i'm on such as now you know I can really kind of, you know, make it happen, but it's often only for an hour. Um, and so I'm, I'll, I'll be in under the weighted blanket for, you know, four hours after this, even though I really enjoy it. And so, yeah, I think that's always been a thing for me that, that I have just kind of managed to um, manoeuvre myself into these roles, whether it's music critic or journalist or, or you know, radio presenter or yeah, role playing and, and, and cosplay where I sort of have, have a, have a show to put on kind of sometimes literally um because i think that i really do struggle in any sort of improvisational um uh environment so whether that's small talk or you know unexpected questions you know if i i um like my granddad used to say what do you know and i would just it was like my brain just fell out of my head i just wouldn't know what to say i was like i don't understand the question like uh, things like that um and i think you know, I think that I think that's definitely true for me, and I definitely know other autistic people who are the same. That when you're in your place or you know mode, um, you can really kind of switch on. And I think, I think that's difficult for some people to understand that idea that you know so-called functioning or you know your support needs can vary. You know that it's not static. So for me, you know, when I'm talking to you or if I'm teaching my students, um, when I'm sort of giving the razzle dazzle, i am pretty got it pretty together. You know, I don't really have pretty low support needs, but, but conversely, if I have to talk, try and talk to somebody in a really loud environment or, you know, work in an office, um, or even like, you know, go to a shop that I don't haven't been to like, or make a phone call, I, I'm basically like catatonic. So, so I think, um, I think people are are starting to understand that more. This idea that you know not only is autism not monolithic, that 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 people's experience of it can vary too. Um, and you know, I've seen people talk about being you know low support needs in some environments and and sort of moderate to high in others. And I think I think that's I'm glad that people are starting to talk about that because yeah, I think it can be confusing for people. You know, I'm sure a lot of people would look at me talking in an interview and go, she seems pretty switched on, you know? 
Um, and it's, it's, it's not a lie, but it's just one aspect of my experience of that. And I think, um, you know, in writing the book, I wanted to focus on moving away from what I think traditionally have been those kind of twin narratives of autism, which is the brilliance one. Um, so the sort of Rain Man model or the savant yeah. or, or the devastating tragedy. Um, when I think most autistic people experience a bit of both, but, but usually something much more kind of neutral and, and nuanced. Um, so to kind of be honest about the moments of tragedy that I've experienced and the moments of triumph, but not try and weight it too much to either extreme. Cause I think in the end, I don't think it helps anybody. You know, mm. the irony is that if you talk with any positivity at all about autism, there are often people, some of them are in our parliament, um, who accuse you of saying, you know, autism is amazing or autism is a gift. It's like, it's not, it's not one or the other. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a bit of all of the above. Oh, there's, there's so much balance in your book and, and it's a really enjoyable read as well, because we really come with you into your passions and your special interests you know, even if they're not ours, because you've mm. done it really well, and you can appreciate that. Thank you. Um, what, what, what would you do though? So, if you are in a situation like I don't know, uh, an after party or, or a literary event, but is that mingling beforehand? What's your kind of solution <laughs> to survive that? Look, I think I've gotten worse at surviving it as time wore on. And, and I think that that's often a common experience for people who are diagnosed later in life uh, or come to understand themselves as autistic later in life is that your ability to push through the things that are difficult for you becomes very limited. So I think in my 20s, well, I drank a lot, you know, that was a big part of it. Um, so I think I, I sort of, there was some quite harmful alcohol use. Um, that was helpful. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, as I got older, you know, and also as I stopped drinking, I sort of started to realize just how terrifying certain, certain environments were. So I think, you know, part of the kind of process of becoming post diagnosis and post writing the book, I think is, is, is recognizing where my sort of struggles lie and, and having to often remind myself, um, that I have, you know, certain support needs uh, or that things are more difficult for me than, than they might be for others. Um, because, you know, when you're not, when you don't know that you're autistic, you sort of go through life doing this kind of ad hoc ABA on yourself where you're trying to be normal. Um, and it can be quite successful, unfortunately. You know, you can repress so much of your true autistic identity that it's hard to, it's hard to get back to a sort of place of authenticity where you can actually just go that is going to be a difficult environment for me or that experience will be hard and maybe I won't do it or maybe I'll give myself, you know, the supports that I need or ask for the supports that I need. Um, and it's, it's still a real process for me, um, you know, uh, whether it's needing a, a, a visual schedule. So, you know, if I'm going to an event and I haven't been to that place before, I'm going to be already in a heightened um, state and I often get just get lost you know I sort of it's like that John Travolta gif where he's like looking around in the room you know and so having done some events with autistic led organizations I've come to realize how helpful that would have been my whole life you know to have somebody go here's a picture of the front door here's the corridor that you walk down you know turn right here and you'll see this picture on the wall like um, stuff like that, uh, even even sort of social scripts and things. You like what to expect when you go to have, you know, like I, I've had, I had a, a a day procedure a couple of years ago, which was just terrifying because I had no idea what was going to happen. And so if somebody had said, "You'll walk in here. This is what the room looks like. It's going to smell like this. The doctor will come out, and you know, blah blah blah," um, that would have been really useful. So. Yeah, I think I'm I think I'm in a sort of period of flux at the moment where once upon a time I would have maybe just sort of pushed through that that discomfort or that 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 um anxiety and now I think I'm kind of taking stock a bit and thinking about, you know, which things I can maybe do without or or um you know, which things I might need some help to kind of get through. Um cuz yeah, it is it is certain things are really hard. Um, and I think too, they often feel harder when some things are so easy, you know, so, so something like going to comic con, uh, or going to see, you know, going to the wrestling, like that's, that's when I'm in my element. So it, it can be really hard to swing between feeling like everything's fine in those environments and then to feel 
like a complete, you know, lost cause because you've got to make a phone call to the bike shop because you need a bolt, you know, which happened to me this morning <laughs> and was like a full like military precision routine of like revving myself up to ring the bike shop, what I'm going to say, you know, hoping they don't give me any like expert level questions that I can't answer and, you know, having to kind of perform. I know what I'm talking about when I ring up to talk about a BMX bike. So yeah, it's um that that process of like unlearning uh, and sort of removing the mask, I guess, is is um is a big thing. And I suppose you know actually it's really a sort of quite a small element of the book because so much of it was sort of looking back at at my life, um, and then the sort of the looking forward is is almost kind of the epilogue, you know. Uh, so that that's something that I expect will continue to be a part of my life for a long time. I think a great thing about getting older, though, is just realizing I don't like doing that thing. Yes, I don't have to. I'm going to exactly. Stop myself do it. And like sometimes you do have to do something like ring the bike shop, but there are also yeah. social things you don't have to do. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and that's the thing. And so, so not only do I not like them, I also have a very concrete excuse to not like them. So I think, I think that's the thing is like. I see, you know, friends of mine who are younger or they, they, they came to understand their autistic identity earlier in their lives and, and they're so much better at just going, oh, I can't do that. You know, like I had a friend say, sorry, I just, I can't come to your book launch. Like I, I too many people in a room and it'll be too noisy and I'd rather stay home, you know, so we'll I'm, book, I'm, right? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> they did. They did. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that that you know that, that's very aspirational to me to be able to just go. Nah, I can't. I can't have a meeting at that coffee shop, which is really super loud. Like, can we can we do it on a park bench or like go to a library or something instead? That's um, yeah. that'll take some learning. It was interesting you mentioned um, using alcohol a lot in your twenties. I, I wonder if that's a really unexplored area with autism. Well, you know, anything like undiagnosed really. Mm. Uh, yeah social lube factor and just feeling like you don't fit in and just trying like the path of least resistance really absolutely i mean it's um i think an emerging you know like like so many things about autism there is a uh, there is less research into you know adult autistic experiences um but the research that i did read uh, for the book and and some of the kind of lived experience stuff was was a very similar story um it was typically people who didn't know that they were autistic so didn't understand why certain social experiences were so difficult um, and but also knew inherently that you're different um, so you know when you're dating or making friends or you know going to the office party you know that that's going to kind of reveal that difference potentially and so I think for me um, you know being a, a, um, drunk was was kind of a way to pretend that that wasn't the case um, you know, it's sort of, I guess, in a way, it's a, it's a great leveler. So you're sort of all a bit chaotic. Um, but yeah, I realised, you know, I realised sort of towards the end of my 20s that it was not um, a healthy way to live. And I think, I mean, like so many things about not understanding my place in the world, whether that was autism, whether it was sort of queerness, um, you know, I think, I think back and I sort of, it's bittersweet because I know that there are experiences that I, um, or things that happened to me that maybe I could have avoided if I hadn't been drinking to excess or, or that I'd known, you know, why I didn't want to go home with that guy, you know, ex for example, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think it's I think it's really under under investigated and I suspect it is a big, particularly a big problem with undiagnosed people. But I think it's also a problem with people who do know that they're autistic. You know, there there is some research to suggest that that you are at danger as a, as an autistic person of certain behaviors um p including addictive behaviors so yeah it's it's like so many aspects of of autistic experience that relate to adults um we're only really just starting to kind of recognize that i, I say we you know more broadly like clinically speaking it, it has traditionally just been weighted so heavily towards children Mm -hmm. um that you can kind of you sort of age out of supports and you, you you age out of being um the topic of research so there is some really good you know interesting qualitative um research starting to emerge uh and at the very least kind of you know lit reviews saying we really need to focus on this more um whether it's yeah you know harmful drug and alcohol use or, or sexual assault or um all sorts of things that 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 relate to autistic adults um but it's a 
it's a long, you know, I think it'll be a long journey. Because if you think about it's only really been in the last few years that we've even understood that there are different presentations on the autism spectrum. So the idea that, you know, um, females or gender diverse people may present differently um, is really only this decade. Um, so yeah, it's, <laughs> there's a lot to be done, but I do think, I do think it's sort of the, the rate of improvements is starting to kind of ramp up, um, which is good. And I think that that has a lot to do with um, the increasing amount of, yeah, like own voices and kind of um, actually autistic voices that, that are, that are making an impact. You know, it's, we're sort of resting a bit of that idea of who the experts are um, away from the clinical and, and being able to kind of tell our own stories. And I think that was why it felt like such a special opportunity to write this book because, you know, we're usually written about, um, not we don't get to write about our own lives. So for me, that was that was a, a political thing, I think, to kind of try and try and even in a way not seek approval from the so-called experts you know there was a moment where i was like oh should we have gotten you know a psychologist to give us a quote for the front cover or something and and um you know the t the team at hardy grant were really great and they said no because you know that's not what you're doing like this yeah. is about asking other autistic people how they feel about it um you know so yeah i think that's that's um that's a big thing for me, but it's really, yeah, it's tricky because, you know, I also appreciate data and I'm a researcher myself. And so there is this kind of tension where it's like, how much do you defer to the, 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 the clinical view and, and how much do you kind of um, try and pull away from that? That makes a lot of sense not to in, in this kind of scenario, because, you know, you embrace the actually autistic hashtag really early on. I mean, not long after you sort of said to people, I am autistic. Mm. Um, I wondered if you um, might tell us a bit about what kind of uh, advocacy work you're doing and, and that kind of area. Yeah, so I think, you know, somebody asked me recently, do I see myself as an activist? And I was like, it's a really interesting question because I sort of feel like I'm an advocate, but at what point does that like tip over into activism? Um, and I think in a way the act of just being publicly autistic is quite, quite a sort of um, is a form of activism in and of itself but I definitely uh, I think mine's quite low-key you know I, I think part of my approach as a teacher is to make um, the classroom a safe space for neurodivergent students for everybody but but you know I guess I I have that that's my lived experience is being an autistic kid um, at uni and knowing how difficult that can be. So, you know, for example, I don't have like no screens or, you know, no headphones in my classroom because ultimately if the difference between you taking in what I'm teaching you and not is, you know, having, having a, some ASMR on in one earbud, then go right ahead. Um, so things like that, I think, you know, being an advocate within the school to, um, uh, or within the faculty, you know, for whether it's other teachers or just environmental kind of accessibility stuff. But yeah, I think more broadly, um, you know, the, the, the book itself was a political act or an act of activism in the sense that I hoped that it would just encourage some people, because, you know, autistic, like we'll read whatever's written about autism. Like I think I, I knew that there would be a built-in audience, which was people who had had a similar experience to me um, or who were going through that. But but I think more broadly, I hoped to just kind of reframe some of those narratives around autism um, or at least encourage people to kind of question them. Because I think particularly around the idea of, you know, the warrior parent or the, the, the sort of the tragedy of parenting the autistic child. And then, you know, read the book. Like I'm not saying it wasn't a walk in the park with me. And I think, you know, in, in many ways um, we had it, we had it easier than a lot of people, but that, that idea that it's just this unrelenting, you know, tragedy, that it's something that has to be, um, you know, eradicated. And these are not like, these, these are terms in the so-called, you know, gold standard therapies that our government recommends, um, our ideas of, yeah, extincting these behaviours and extinguishing them. Um, and that's, you know, like horrendous to me. Obviously, I don't have any lived experience of that. In a way, I guess I was lucky. Um, but yeah, to try and, um, to try and kind of shift that focus a bit and also I guess give um, 
use my kind of lived experiences as, as obviously it's just one example, but it is an example. And there are so many aspects of autism when you've just been diagnosed or maybe your kid's been diagnosed or a family member or someone, you know, that, that are just like gobbledygook, you know, you get told all of these things about how you have circumscribed interests or they'll have this, that, and the other, or restrictive patterns of, of, you know, X, Y, Z. And you sort of go, what does that mean? Like, um, so to be able to kind of give these examples of saying, all right, this is what, how, you know, circumscribed interests present. Here's an example from when I was crazy about dinosaurs. Um, and, you know, I've, I've, a friend of mine who's a psychologist who works in autism said she, that was something that she found really helpful about the book was to just be able to point to stuff and go, here's a chapter about echolalia. This is, this is how it looked, you know, for this person. And so it might be something that you can keep an eye out for in your kids. So, so in a way, I guess, using my own experience for, um, (laughs) <laughs> for good and not evil because I didn't I didn't want it to just be a, a memoir um not that I think my life experience has no value but I I you know I've been in the trenches like I've I've been to the circus as far as like the personal essay industrial complex is concerned um and I didn't want it to just be about that so I think it was a sort of uh nice bargain that I made with myself where it's like, all right, I'll tell some of my story and it will be in the service of helping people, you know, understand these issues more broadly, hopefully, you know. Um, And then part of that was also having the the epilogue at the back of, of, you know, other actually autistic people who who I know. um, And just to kind of give a little sense of the differences of experiences that can happen um, in the autistic community, which is, you know, vast. And I think that's something that's, that's, that people are really only just starting to appreciate that, that it's such a, you know, it's a, it's a real kind of hoary old chestnut at this point, but that, that idea of, you know, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, but it is true, you know, um, there are, there is no one autism, um, which, uh, is, you know, it's something I wanted to reflect, even though the bulk of what I was talking about was my, my personal experience. Yeah, I think it works really well because, yeah, as you say, sort of reading a list of like a checklist, mm. completely unfathomable. I've got so many questions, but we've got a lot of people in this Zoom room. And so I'm going to let them have a go and then I'm going to sweep in whenever I can. Um, we have a lot of questions. Oh, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, which is great. So, look, um, there's a couple of questions that relate to partners of mm-hmm. um, people who've been diagnosed with autism, which I think is really interesting. So I'll I'll say them together. Carol sort of asked about, um, you know, what is it like for you navigating emotions, um, mm. your own or the other person's in a romantic, in, in, you know, intimate relationship? And do you think there are particular challenges because of your autism? But mm. also um, there's a question from Bianca about the partner's of someone who is pretty sure that they um, have autism and um, and that late in light diagnosis. What do you have any experience with how um, a partner can deal with that? Well, I'm really lucky because my girlfriend is also autistic, <laughs> so that that has been um, you know a real uh, just like basically utopian experience for me. But yeah, it has always been. I think very difficult because because for me often I mean the, the, there's also an asterisk in that I was predominantly dating you know what appeared to be um, you know straight relationships so I was mostly dating cis straight guys and um, was like why why am I not enjoying this oh okay well it took 2020 to kind of finally make me realize where I was actually at but. I do think that, yeah, emotional stuff was often really difficult for me. And, and I think back to, you know, some of the relationships that I do have fond memories of. I think that was that was tricky, that um, often my reactions were not what was, you know, expected or hoped of me in certain circumstances. I think that was hard. You know, with Catherine and I, it's good because there's no bullshit. You know, I guess because we're both autistic, we can kind of just say what we feel. And so sometimes she'll just say, I actually just want you to, you know, um, reassure me about this or give me a hug. And, and, and so that's, that's been really useful. Um, I think as far, as far as, you know, supporting somebody on that, that journey of, of, um, of realization is concerned, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing, you know, and for me, um, 
in a way the stars aligned i was really lucky that uh, you know a, a friend of mine had a had a family member who was being diagnosed so you know i i was told of a place that i could get diagnosed which is difficult for adults and particularly for you know people who are not men um uh that they had an opening um that at the time i was employed which is unusual for autistic people we're often very chronically underemployed so in a way you know I'm sort of careful to not make diagnosis sound like the be all and end all because obviously it's not accessible to everybody. Um, but I think I think supporting somebody through that sort of what we all do and even what I did, which is that sort of initial like informal process of not so much self-diagnosis, but just kind of starting to kind of recognise aspects of yourself in what you're reading. Um, I think just keep an open mind and, and, and try and be supportive. You know, I think... I think that when people say stuff like, no, surely not, or aren't we all a bit autistic, or you must not be, you know, very, very, very much affected by it. I know that it's coming from a place of trying to reassure, but I think, you know, it was something I heard often. Um, and the problem is if you're older and you're starting to think that you might be autistic or you're starting to think about being assessed, it's usually because you can't keep it up any longer. Um so that idea of, well, you didn't get picked up because it wasn't very serious is often not accurate at all. It's, it's, you didn't get picked up because the parameters weren't there, you know, that the screening processes were different or because you did a really good job of trying to keep it together. And, you know, that mask was so convincing. So there's actually, I think, increasing amounts of people now, particularly women and gender diverse people who are being assessed as, you know, officially um, having what we would, might call, you know, autism spectrum disorder level two, but presenting as level one. I mean, I, you know, I have a lot of problems with the levels. They're really just a new way of, of having a functioning label. But I think that's, that's the thing. It's like, there are people who have just had to force themselves into, you know, these, what is it? Square peg round hole. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but but I think I think you know the, the the main thing for me was that I just was very lucky to have a very supporting and loving family um, the whole way through, and and that may be your actual family, it may be found family, it could be you know friends and and partners, but I think I think that's the big thing. And you know if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I think I'm thinking this might be me, or they give you something to read, you know, just try and keep an open mind. Um, and and just kind of be be there with them on that journey if you can um because it's a special thing you know it's a, it is a special thing for somebody to reveal that to you if it's if it's a sort of nascent idea that they have about themselves um so you know tread tread gently there's um there's a related question too um Rubens said that um his father um is 65 and is um kind of interested in um in getting a diagnosis at this point very late bloomer um would you <laughs> suggest that that's a that's a useful thing for him or um you know at that late stage in life it, will it change anything for somebody absolutely you know i think the thing is you know it's important to remember there are almost no supports for autistic adults um it's an absolute crisis so in terms of it being you know your ticket to to getting any help whatsoever um, from the government in particular, you know, it's not really about that. But but I, I, I just always remember what my GP said when I went to get the referral, which it was so funny because I, you know, I've been seeing my GP for yonks and, and there was a part of me which was like, oh, I didn't want to ask her because I sort of felt embarrassed or like like she might not agree or she would stop seeing me. and. And she just said, absolutely, you know, it's great to know more about yourself. Like whatever the result is, you, you will at least know something more about your experience. And for me, um, the process of looking into autism and then seeking that diagnosis was um, was a real, you know, journey of self, self kind of actualization. And, um, and part of it for me too, like one of the reasons that I, I sort of pursued it officially, so to speak, was I just was fascinated by the process. Like I've always been very interested in that kind of stuff. And so to get to kind of take stock of my life um, was was really useful for me. And that was an, the, the same friend who said, lol, we have had our suspicions about you. You know, I messaged them and said, um, so, if, you know, I've put together this folder of stuff to bring in and some notes to take to the assessment. You know, do you think that's appropriate? And she was like, I think that's like the most autistic thing I've ever heard. <laughs> But yeah, I know of some super, super late bloomers. You know, I know of people uh, diagnosed in their 60s, 70s, 80s. Like, um, I think it's always worthwhile. You know, the caveat is uh, that it's often difficult to get 
a diagnosis to, to get assessed. But but to even just go through that process of starting to understand yourself and reading some things that might be, you know, might resonate with you, I think that's really valuable. And a lot of people who are older, you know, don't feel the need to, to get the, you know, the license, so to speak. Um, but I think if you want to do that, then then go for it. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm just always careful to note that, you know, it's not accessible to everybody and it's not as... Um, you know, there's not as much support as it. Well, there's none, but there's, you know, compared to like trying to get a two-year-old assessed, um, it is it is a difficult, a different experience. But I think it's definitely worthwhile, however you approach it, um, whatever your age, because then you know, like I said earlier, it gives you this way to understand your experiences, but also it gives you the opportunity to go. This is why I can't do certain things, or I don't want to do certain things. You know, it sort of gives you that that um that license to be be gentle with yourself right well there's um also a question about where um to get (laughs) assessed is that something that where where do you suggest people go (laughs) well um uh, amaze uh have a really great service called autism connect which has gone national um just recently so i helped i helped launch that a couple of months ago um, so if you go to their website, um, so it's just called Amaze Autism Connect. They have got, uh, you know, a very big portion of the team is, is you know, hashtag actually autistic. So some, a lot of the advisors are autistic and they have that lived experience. Um, and they can provide you with, you know, lists of services near you. Um, they might be able to provide you with uh, a guide to, you know, where, where clinics are in your city um, that might be able to talk to you. I mean, I guess one of the good things is the, the sort of silver linings of the Zoom era um, is that I think some people have been able to seek, you know, some supports online where they might not have been able to before um, because of distance. Uh, but yeah, I really, I think that's a great idea you know, ask around. Sometimes you might know, you know, someone whose who's child or, or, or loved one has recently been diagnosed. Um, you know, if you have a good relationship with your GP or you're, you're already seeing a, a professional, you know, like a psychologist or psychiatrist, ask them. But yeah, I think, I think Autism Connect is a really useful, um, a really useful thing. And I've, I've used it myself. Um, so that would be, I think, the first port of call, I reckon. Um, and then, yeah, failing that, just, just, you know, check in with the actually autistic community online. I think that's a really, it's a really supportive place, uh, whether that's, you know, Instagram or, or, or um, meetup groups or Facebook groups. Um, uh, but yeah, it is, you know, it is trickier, but I think, I think increasingly there is a recognition of the fact that there is, you know, what Simon Baron Cohen calls the lost generation. So there's a, there is an understanding that there's a need out there. So in that sense, at least it's better than it was, you know, five or 10 years ago. Look, I'm aware that we only have five minutes left before <laughs> we're going and we've got 20 million questions. Um, I think that you've answered quite a lot of them already in, in your talk and a lot of the other questions will be answered by reading the book as well. So I'm going to do a plug to um, purchase the book. Nice. <laughs> um, and if you're um, purchasing the book, um, think about purchasing from Avid because we're running the event or if you're in a lockdown community, your lockdown bookshop um, would be the best port of call because we really want you to support those bookshops that can't trade at the moment. Um, so, Jenny, I might hand back t- um, to you for the for any closing um, comments that you guys might have before we end the event tonight. Well, I mean, I've got a thousand more questions, but, Clem, did you want to cover some? <laughs> Is there some <laughs> part you want to wrap up with some thoughts in particular? Oh, my God. I don't know. It's, um, you know, I mean, thank you very much, Avid, for, for holding this event. And it's it's always such a thrill to see people show up and and. and and have that you know enthusiastic um, amount of questions. I think it really shows that there is this growing need for more supports, um, but also that that people are starting to recognise you know maybe something about themselves that they hadn't known. And you know, like I, I sort of think about myself. I'm a pretty switched on person. I work. I have worked as a journalist. You know, I'm a researcher, and so it, a lot of it was news to me. So I think. I think for for your average person who maybe isn't constantly um, knows in twenty books at a time, uh, you know the idea that there might be some something more about them that would explain experiences of, that they've had is a real is a real huge thing. So, yeah, I think um, get out there and you know I'm just one own voice. Like we're we're really lucky in Australia. There are some other amazing autistic writers, both in fiction and in in nonfiction and. 
just kind of read a bunch of it and see what, you know, see what resonates with you. Because it's the other thing, you know, I'm, God, I'm, I'm watching the clock as I say this, but <laughs> the, the idea of, you know, the, the female presentation, it's not another binary. It's not that you're either Rain Man or you're, you know, everything's going to be okay, but, but that it, you might be that. So I know, I know, you know, men who fit the so-called president, uh, <laughs> feminine presentation, and vice versa, and you know, non-binary people who are sort of a mix of, of, of experiences. But but the idea that that might be possible, I think, is a real is a real huge thing for people. So, um, you know, have a read about about what it might look like, and have a think about whether that that you know, you recognise something of yourself in that. Um, and yeah, I think just. I think people are getting better at recognizing that, that there is such a diverse range of experiences uh, within autism. Um, and that's great. I mean, you even look at like the difference between seasons one and two of love on the spectrum, like what a, what a massive leap forward that second season was. Um, and so that's really exciting to me, you know, so I'm really looking forward to like a year, five years from now, like what other texts about autism will have been authored by autistic people. There's a couple of questions um, that have come through about grief as well. Um, mm. Do you want to touch on, is there is there a kind of grief that comes from a diagnosis yeah. as well as a, a relief? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think initially I was like very positive because I was, you know, I was excited to know that about myself and I also didn't want it to be like, I got the bad news today, you know. Um, but, yeah, there is it, there is, and I think people should expect expect an element of that and I think it continues you know for me it's um it's about those missed opportunities but it's also about that thing of you know a friend of a friend of mine calls it having ABA yourself you know in a way you have extinguished so many autistic um authentic autistic experiences and behaviors and and part of that that grief for me is wondering whether I will ever be able to reconnect with them you know are there some things that are just kind of lost forever and I can just you know sort of bittersweetly observe them in other people and feel feel thankful that some people are able to you know be authentically um autistic so that is hard you know I think I think it's a very bittersweet experience but I think it's a really valid one um you know and and I would hope that people you know, we we'll just go into it expecting a real roller coaster, you know, but I think that even if it is, even if you do have that period of mourning uh, or grief, I think it's, it's still really worth it because then at least, you know, you know, at least you understand why certain things happened and why you do certain things and you can't go back in time and, and change the past, but, you know, you can kind of be kinder to yourself in the future and, and, and recognize and recognize that autistic part of you well it is you you know it's not a part of you um but kind of understand yourself with a with a renewed um yeah appreciation for the, the autistic um experiences that you've had rather than them just being this kind of baffling mystery so yeah i think the grief is a, it's a big thing and i think i think that there's probably some of that in the book you know i think i was very careful not to just be like and now i understand everything you know it was like um it was like okay now, and that's sad you know so it was I, I i am sad for you know little little clem for some of the experiences that she had and also not so little clem but um but i'm sort of excited to see what will come next as i sort of continue that that process of you know peeling away the the facade Look, I think that for um, a lot of the people who have um, shared in the chat that they are also had a diagnosis or are getting a diagnosis in the process of it, um, mm. I think that your book will be uh, an absolutely fantastic um, reference for them um, with a personal voice. I know my sister's only just recently had a diagnosis and um, my family are probably undiagnosed. Um, and I, I, I hear what you're saying and I recognise so much in it. And I think that that's the best way to connect is to actually read someone's personal journey and to find those connections. So it's been fantastic um, to listen to you tonight, Clem. And Jenny, you did a fantastic job with the questions as well, always. Thanks. I'd you're like to say quickly, actually, because it would be hard for Clem to say this, but this book has a really broad appeal. It would be hard to say it without sounding like you're plugging your book. But oh, it, yeah, it's a, it's a four-quadrant blockbuster. <laughs> it does. It has a really broad appeal because it's so well written and there's so much to get stuck into in terms of, like, the pop culture and just going really deep into different kind of areas that, you know, it's, it's really broad. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And thank you all for coming. You know, it's a really, it means a lot to me, especially down here in, in lockdown. It's, um, it's a real treat. So... 
I'm I'm excited for for those of you who will read it that um for for you to be able to go on that that time traveling journey with me. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. And um, this will um, be available to re-listen to for anyone who does like to do that in about a week on our YouTube channel. So, um, you know, it'll be fantastic to come and and revisit that. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and um, have a great time with the rest of your virtual book tour. Let's hope there's some of it that will be in real life. (laughs) Fingers crossed. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Karen. Bye, everyone.